Good afternoon from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Fortune, and I would like to welcome you to today's broadcast of the NCCWSC's Climate Change Science in the Management webinar series. This series is held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. Today's webinar, Relationship among climate, water quality, and toxic blooms of golden alga in Texas will be presented by Ronaldo Patino with the USGS Texas Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. I would like to welcome Dr. Sean Carter to introduce our speaker. Sean? Thanks, Ashley. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. Uh, today, I'm pleased to introduce Ronaldo Patino, who's our leader of the USGS Texas Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. Uh, he's also a professor of the Departments of Natural Resource Management and Biological Sciences at Texas Tech University. Ronaldo has degrees from Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology and also uh, master's and PhD degrees from Fishery Science in Oregon State University. He's also done postdoctoral work at uh, the Texas Marine Science Institute. Uh, Ronaldo has 30 years of research experience in the fields of uh, comparative and reproductive physiology and etoxicology, and over the past several years, his lab has focused much of their attention on the area of water quality, uh, especially harmful algal bloom, blooms and impacts to fish populations, which you'll hear about today. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Ronaldo Patino. It's yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, uh, first, I'd like to thank the center, uh, Sean and, and others, and uh, for the invitation to present, uh, give this webinar of the work we're, we've been doing, and, and, and also I'd like to thank the audience for uh, you know, taking your time to, uh, uh, to listen to this presentation. Uh, hopefully uh, you'll find some uh, useful information in it. Uh, as usual, I'd like to start with a disclaimer that you see on, uh, on this first slide that uh, you know, this work has been recently completed and we're analyzing data, interpreting, and uh, uh, conclusions are not final. We're still looking at things and trying to understand what, what we found. Uh, and in fact, I, if anybody has any suggestions uh, uh, and comments, uh, I'll be very, uh, very uh, uh, w w appreciated if, uh, if, if you, you share those with, with me uh, at the end of this uh, webinar or, or later time. Uh, so what I, what I like to do first is, uh, well, let's see if this works. It was working a while ago. There you go. Uh, just uh, for those of you who not, may not be uh, too familiar with uh, golden alga, uh, it was the first record of a toxic bloom was recorded in Pecos River in Texas in, uh, back in 1985. Also, uh, a large range expansion occurred in, in 2001 when uh, multiple major reservoirs in the Red, Brazos, and Colorado rivers were, were hit with the, with the alga. So this was kind of a... Uh, 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 a key year in terms of, of, of the ex expansion of this alga. It is now, has been, uh, blooms of the alga, toxic blooms have been reported in, in uh, last time I counted, uh, at, at least 20 uh, states. Uh, in Texas, uh, the majority of uh, uh, golden alga populations are, are, have been determined to be genetically related to uh, Scottish strains of this alga. So it is believed that, uh, you know, what we have in Texas, the strains we have in Texas have an origin uh, in, uh, in, in, in Scotland. Uh, the other thing that is uh, maybe uh, key to, to keep in mind as, as I'm be giving some, some data later is that the, the blooms typical, typically occur in winter. Uh, you know, they can start, uh, a typical bloom would probably start in late fall and continue through the, through the winter or, or early spring. Uh, sometimes they're, they may be uh, long-lasting uh, in certain places, and sometimes they may last for just a couple, three weeks. But they, they normally happen during the colder uh, times of the year. So one question, and I will expand on this later, but uh, one question uh, in our mind when we started doing this work is, was the 2001 expansion uh, of the alga in Texas in particular uh, due to a novel introduction in, into pre-existing Habitat that was favorable to the alga, or was this more of a, I don't know, something that may have uh, that, uh, conditions that existed for a while, or is this the result of uh, changing ambient conditions that made it possible for the alga to become 
uh, to, to become established and, and, and boom at, at around 2001. So, uh, and this these gradual changes could have happened as a result of development, uh, you know, uh, human development or, or climate change. So, uh, again, we'll come back to this question later. Uh, just give you a, a brief, uh, I guess, synopsis of what the current understanding of, of uh, how climate change relates to harmful algal blooms. And in general, uh, there's a number of review, review papers I've listed here uh, state that, uh, you know, uh, climate will uh, either uh, la development or climate will increase uh, eutrophication, uh, salinity, some cases temperature and so forth, and, and that's how uh, you know the this will then influence uh, the 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 incidence and uh, also severity of, of harmful harmful algal blooms. Uh, in particular, uh, my understanding is that uh, the uh, how how people view that climate change will you know may worsen the the incidence of HABs is. Primarily by changes in water quality, uh, and, and again that includes eutrophication and salinity. But specifically for golden alga, the, the relationships between water quality and bloom events are not uh, very clear yet. Uh, people, there's a, a number of labs who are working on this, but the, the relationships are not really well understood. And also projections of increased bloom frequency and severity due to climate change are based on essentially conceptual scenarios, uh, and, and there is. Uh, uh, limited empirical data to 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 uh, support those uh, scenarios. But uh, another thing maybe worth uh, keeping in mind, and this may be specific for Texas, but most reservoirs in Texas, uh, up to at least those that are known, 90% uh, of the reservoirs are already classified as eutrophic to hypereutrophic, and so it seems. Uh, in, in our opinion, it seems unlikely that uh, further increases or changes in eutrophication would be a major factor that would influence uh, the spread of golden algae in the future uh, because they're already up there, levels of nutrients. So this leaves salinity as, as one factor of, of interest. Uh, so just, uh, uh, I'm sure you, some of you know this uh, far better than I do, but uh, the, the, th this is a, a uh, excerpt an uh, image of a, of a page that I uh, took from uh, uh, Carl et al. in 2009 uh, that shows that uh, temperatures, this is the Great Plains, uh, the, which includes down there uh, the bottom is Texas, uh, temperature is uh, projected to continue to increase. Uh, precipitation will change uh, according to the scenarios. Uh, it may become wetter in, in the north but drier in the south. Uh, and there will be an increase in extreme events uh, as well. So this is what uh, the climate is projected to, to be in the next uh, 100 years or so. Uh, give you an idea of uh, uh, the situation in Texas in terms of precipitation, this is data compiled by the uh, USGS. Uh, uh, shows the, the uh, yearly average for between 61 and 1990 of the gradient precipitation from east to west in Texas. So you can see it's wetter in the east and becomes drier as you go to the west. And this slide shows you, uh, you know, essentially reflects that. Uh, th this is, uh, uh, you know, the colors here represent reservoirs in Texas and their their uh, status. Uh, you know, their their uh, uh, essentially how much water they have. And 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 as you can see, they're fuller, uh, more more to capacity in the east than they are in the west. So so this kind of reflects the the the, the uh, precipitation gradient that is uh, observed is naturally observed in this in, in this area in, in Texas. Uh, so, one answer that, that we're trying to address in order to understand uh, how climate and golden alga may be uh, associated in, in reservoirs uh, is uh, one specific question we're asking is, has the quality of reservoir wa uh, water in Texas changed over the years and also in a manner that is consistent with being driven by climate change? And a yes answer to this would be, Consistent with a scenario where, as climate change continues to, uh, as climate continues to change, so would be so would be the the the, the spread or severity of, of golden alga blooms. Uh, a no answer would not rule out future influence of climate change, but perhaps would also suggest that there may be other factors that also play uh, important roles. So, with that question in mind, the specific 
research objectives of, of our, our, our uh, at least part of the research is, you know, we would like to first uh, uh, kind of, de uh, based on water quality, define w what is what is golden algae habitat at the landscape uh, landscape scale. Uh, the next question is uh, what what variables they may be the same, may be different that uh, that associate with actual bloom bloom events. Um, and then also, third, uh, to determine trends in water quality, uh, and we've chosen a period of 20 years that bracket in the period of uh, the first appearance of uh, blooms in, in, in 2001 in, in, in major Texas reservoirs. So these are our three specific research objectives that I, you know, essentially I'll be talking about uh, today. Uh, the information gathered for the, from these uh, studies can obviously be used to uh, develop uh, water quality criteria uh, for uh, management and, and or mitigation uh, purposes. Uh, but it also uh, can be used to understand uh, golden algae dispersal mechanisms and also more accurately project how climate change may influence future the future spatial distribution of golden algae. And these are the two that I'll, the last two are the ones that I'll be focusing on today in terms of the application of, 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 of the data. Uh, the, the sources, data sources that we've used, we've used some of our own data that we've collected during the course of short-term studies. Uh, they range from uh, some ongoing studies of uh, uh, two years to, to five years. But primarily we use a, a data set that was put together by our colleagues from the Texas Water Science Center, Burley et al., and, uh, that, uh, where they collected data from, I believe, was up to 59 reservoirs in Texas and, and put it all in one place. So this is a very useful uh, resource uh, in order to study, uh, uh, you know, spatial temporal uh, distribution of water uh, quality, uh, and re this is reservoirs. Um, so uh, re reservoirs we've chosen for most of our studies uh, include reservoirs from the Brazos and Colorado River basins. Uh, we've also used... Uh, uh, we also looked at other other basins, but primarily uh, these are the two basins, and, and we, we're looking at both uh, golden algae impact, that you can see here with the with the um, asterisks here. Uh, those are impacted, um, uh, and also non-impacted reservoirs as as, as, as reference. Uh, and uh, the date, uh, the uh, first toxic bloom in, in all of these impacted reservoirs, uh, or the majority of them, was was in 2001. So first question or first objective, what are the water quality variables that define golden algae habitat? For this purpose, we use uh, both short-term and medium-term data sets. Uh, again, th this is uh, short-term is our ongoing studies and, and medium-term data sets include up to the time, 2001, when, when golden algae blooms first began. Uh, we're using multivariate analysis to describe patterns in distribution of water quality. Uh, essentially, not 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 only, but essentially, principal component analysis. And you see here the number uh, of, of the variables that we included. This, this the number of variables depends on the source of data. Sometimes, uh, or the or the reservoir. Sometimes the data for certain variables is very limited for certain reservoirs, or um, or sometimes non-existent. So so this is you know included at least this. Four variables that I'm showing here, and depending on the on the on the study or the or the reservoir, also other variables. Uh, one thing to to note, I wanted to note that specific conductance, chlorine and sulfates, in both in the Brazos and Colorado, are highly uh, correlated with each other, and 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 therefore we 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 we, uh, we feel we can use either one of them as proxy for uh, salinity in terms of patterns, you know, uh, temporal patterns, assessing temporal patterns. Uh, so this is the first data slide. Um, uh, this shows the uh, some work we've been. This is ongoing uh, survey of water quality of the Double Mountain Fork, which essentially is the is the upper uh, no, Brazos River, uh, which begins. Uh, this is Lubbock right here, where I am right now, and uh, so this is the Double Mountain Fork here, uh, Alan Henry and other places. Anyway, we've been collecting data in in this from the fork, uh, several sites for a number of years, and. What this plot here, here shows is that the when you, you know, after you know, ordination or you know, uh, PCA, the the data quality, uh, uh, water quality data sort out. You can see here they're labeled according to whether the the observations came from non-golden algae sites 
or golden aldehydes, and you can see that they you know, very clearly separate according to salinity. This is the salinity vector here. You can see these are the ve various vectors. So the the, uh, the 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 x or the pc1 vector capture salinity associated variables, and the y or pc2 vec uh, axis capture. Th th these are you no know, temperature and this, all, but this is more reflects seasonality. Th this is uh, data that we collected year round. So, so this is the, this, the vertical distribution is is, uh, is is influenced by season. But the one thing that I like you to uh, I wanted to point out here more than anything is that there's one site. It's a stream site. It's not a lake, but where you can occasionally see extreme high levels of salinity, but it is a non-golden algae site. Uh, this. Keep this in mind, it will come back later. Uh, you know, we'll, this finding will come back up later. Uh, another uh, recently completed study, short term, but, but year round, uh, of the Upper Colorado River. You can see this is the area where the lakes were located in Texas. Uh, this is the Colorado River here. Uh, and again, you can see that um, the lakes, whether they're golden alga or non golden alga, they're separated primarily, if not exclusively, by variable specific conductance, conductance, hardness, also fluoride, but variables primarily that are, are related to uh, salinity. Now this is this is actually data uh, from from our the project I'm presenting today, uh, the, the funded by the by the center. Uh, this is basin wide. We have a total of we, we're looking at a total of 12 reservoirs in the Brazos and Colorado, and also including golden alga and non-golden alga. It is winter data. Uh, remember, I said uh, golden alga blooms in winter, so we, we wanted to look at the specific condi conditions in winter that define golden alga habitat. And so we've removed the season effects from from this from this data set or from this plot. And you can see again primarily uh, data. This is non-golden alga sites, and these are golden alga sites in terms of habitat. Uh, and again, the, uh, they're primarily separated by specific conductance sulfate chloride. You know, again, all proxies are you know, related to salinity. But you can see here, they were also tended to be associated with slightly high, slightly, and I must emphasize that word, slightly higher pH values slightly higher dissolved oxygen values, and slightly lower temperature values in winter. So that was so far about habitat. Now how about water variables that associate with the actual, essentially real time, so to speak, uh, bloom events? Is there anything that stands out? Uh, for this purpose, we use classification regression tree analysis, where we use water quality variables as the predictor variables, and and either a, a toxic bloom or presence of, of golden algal cells as the as the uh, as the dependent variable. And and to show you, go right to the data. This is a short term data year round, uh, and almost I guess no surprise uh, when when when. In this, in the Upper Colorado River, the ma the main uh, predictor for incidence of, of blooms, you know, either on the, the bottom B here, the graph B is is uh, here where is a, the association is with lethal ichthyotoxicity. You know, levels are that are lethal, uh, and A is more related to golden algae cells, numbers of cells. But either way, we got a very sim essentially identical uh, pattern where specific conductance is the primary predictor variable. And you can see that salinity is uh, above you know, 3,700 or so, which is you know, roughly uh, an estimated is about two uh, PSUs. Um, resulted in uh, in much higher cell densities than uh, salinity is lower than, than that level. Uh, and but if it's salinity was higher, remember this is year-round data, it includes summer, winter, spring, and so forth. Temperature was also, was also a predictor variable. Essentially, uh, levels that were below about 21, 22 uh, uh, resulted in higher cell numbers and level, uh, temperature levels that were above. Uh, and again, the same pattern uh, held up when we were using ichthyotoxicity as the, as the response variable. Uh, 
The reason temperature is here is because, as I said, is because year-round data, and essentially this is this is telling us that temperatures, when they start becoming warmer, no, this is probably uh, in the upper Colorado River. These are long-lasting uh, blooms in in, in 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 the upper Colorado River. Uh, that's kind of unique for this for this site. But the, when they're starting to get uh, very warm, uh, higher than than this, then then saline, uh, cell levels and infusivity is is lower. Now this is data using the the uh, a longer term data set, uh, basin wide winter data only. So we've removed the the season uh, uh, influence here. Uh, but so this resulted in, in much simpler trees. And again, uh, either chloride uh, or specific conductance in Colorado, where the top split variable both obviously are as I said earlier they're related to salinity. Uh, a chloride level of about uh, 2028. More or less, more or less, uh, is equivalent to a specific conductance of about 1184, which more or less, and this is all approximations, a PSU of about 0.6. Uh, in this case, uh, specific conductance uh, of the, the, no, 2,000 uh, microsiemens per centimeter is about one uh, PSU. So in both basins, salinity is the best predictor of bloom occurrence. Um, when, when uh, you know, after removing uh, the season, uh, seasonal influences, and this particular results here are similar to the short-term data, the uh, results of the short-term data that I showed you uh, in the previous slide. Uh, so this is uh, an ongoing study, and the reason I'm showing it uh, for in the Pecos River, uh, it's not related to the to the center-funded uh, project that I'm reporting on today, but it's interesting uh, in that we have found that this is presence or absence of golden algae, not, not, not toxicity. Uh, we have found that there seems to be an upper limit of salinity where above that level, you have of about 18,000, you have very little incidence of golden algae occurrence, whereas a higher level, a lower level, I'm sorry, then uh, you have hardness having some influence here, but I wanted to, what I wanted to point out is that when you have even lower levels of, of uh, specific conductance here, you, 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 that's when you have the higher levels of golden alga uh, appearance. So the, the take-home message from, from our Pecos River ongoing study is that there seems to be an upper limit, which is somewhat odd because this alga is supposed to be a coastal uh, or estuarine species, but there seems to be, at least in, in inland Texas, uh, this work includes uh, uh, sampling sites in New Mexico as well, but there seems to be an, an upper limit of, uh, of salinity for golden alga to be present. And it seems that as the salinity, uh, as it gets lower, you know, from about 11 PSU to about 5 PSU, that's when you have most of the occurrences of golden alga. Uh, now, I should point out, this salinity is still much higher than the salinity is in the Brazos or Colorado River. Uh, again, remember we're talking here about the Pecos River. Uh, this study is still ongoing, uh, so conclusions are preliminary, but I thought this is uh, 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 of interest to, to, to the topic of, of this presentation, so, so that's what I'm showing to you. There seems to be an upper limit of salinity for golden alga to, to occur. Uh, to, to summarize so far, we have the golden alga, alga habitat in Texas surface waters. Uh, it's primarily characterized by moderate salinity, uh, if, it, if it's correctly defined. Uh, moderate, uh, anyway, salinity is between 0.6 to 11 PSU, uh, approximate, uh, represented primarily by specific conductance, chloride, and sulfates. Uh, and in reservoirs, this may not apply for streams, but in reservoirs also slightly higher winter pH in the salt boxes and slightly lower winter temperature now. Again, we're defining habitat here. Uh, uh, we're not claiming that this, you know, we do believe, obviously, and uh, we're not the only ones, that salinity is important for golden alga. We do not know if there's differences between golden alga and non-golden alga lakes in terms of pH and the dissolved oxygen or temperature have a biological re relevance. Here we're just reporting uh, results of you know, our classification or definition of habitat where, you know, where, where golden alga uh, occurs. Uh, uh, the results of classification uh, uh, tree analysis then also suggest the same thing, essentially that uh, golden alga events, bloom events, are associated with more moderate salinity. Uh, so essentially habitat 
and conditions for blooms are one and the same, at least given the variables that we have measured in the study. Uh, now, the, the apparent upper limit on salinity uh, would be a novel, novel finding, uh, but again, this is our conclusion. This conclusion is based primarily on observations of a still ongoing study of the Pecos River, and, and we're not done there yet. So, but uh, I thought it's interesting. It, it kind of matches uh, uh, somewhat, so, uh, somewhat the results we, we found for the upper Brazos River as well, where we had a, a high salinity site that has never had golden algae blooms. Uh, so trend, trend analysis have changes occurred, uh, and again we chose a 20-year period bracketing the onset of blooms in 2001. The variables we use for these analyses are essentially the same as, as uh, already mentioned. We use trend analysis, Kendall Tau, if it's uh, seasonally grouped data, or seasonal Kendall Tau, Tau it, when, when we use, we're using also monthly uh, monthly averages. Uh, for some of the analysis, and the, the data is from Burley et al. primarily. Uh, so this table shows the results of for the Brazos River watershed. I'm, I'm highlighting in yellow the golden alga uh, lakes that have had golden alga events in the past, and the ones that are not highlighted in this case for the Brazos uh, are, are reference lakes. And these are the various variables, and to make make it easier for you, uh, just uh, just tell you there's no trends. Uh, none of those variables uh, during that 20-year period underwent significant trends. That's for the Brazos. For the Colorado, um, again, these are the Golden Alga lakes that we had in the Colorado River. The rest are reference lakes. Um, we did find some trends, but those were for the uh, uh, two of the reference lakes, non-golden algae lakes, to, for decreasing salinity. You can see chloride, specific conductance in this case, and sulfate in these two lakes, all of those three variables uh, significantly decrease during that period, suggesting a, 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 a slight uh, decrease in, in, in salinity. But nothing, nothing else. Now, we did also do uh, long-term trend analysis using the full period of record uh, uh, represented in Burley et al. Uh, and just, I'm showing here just some relevant uh, summary, a relevant summary from, from those analyses. Uh, the only consistent trend that we observed between gold, uh, across reservoirs, I'm sorry, both either golden alga or non-golden alga was an increase in total phosphorus or eutrophication. It was only one exception, and that was if it spans uh, this over a longer period of time that we use for the other analysis, uh, shorter term or mid-term analysis, uh, did show an uh, increase in total phosphorus. Uh, this is consistent, obviously, with natural cultural eutrophication of uh, as reservoirs age. And one thought we have is that the reason it expands is uh, it, it did not show a trend is because it's been the target of restoration efforts to reduce uh, total salt solids, and, and this could potentially also have reduced the inputs of nutrients. Uh, but I also wanted to point out one thing, though, that I said this earlier, but about 90% of Texas reservoirs are already classified as eutrophic or hyper-eutrophic. Uh, this trends that we measure here include, in some cases, from the beginning of the, re uh, the when the reservoirs were first filled up, so uh, that's why we're seeing trends here. But Today, they're all, most of reservoirs in Texas are already eutrophic or hypertrophic. So just as an overall summary, uh, habitat for golden alga in Brazos, Colorado, and Pecos rivers is characterized by uh, waters of a moderate range of salinities uh, with uh, an apparent, uh, again, this pending the completion of our study, but an apparent uh, upper limit and obviously also on a lower limit that's been already, that's well known for golden algae. They need a certain level of salinity to, to grow. But what may be novel from our studies here is that there seems to be, at least in inland waters, uh, potentially a higher limit uh, to their growth. Um, and again, this is habitat, bloom events themselves. There's almost no difference, as I said earlier, and at least in Brazil and Colorado, is associated, the only variable we could see associated uh, with bloom events was, was salinity uh, when when we use 
only winter data. If we use year-round data, then we also see temperature having an, an influence. Uh, in terms of the results of trend analysis, uh, we found no significant monotonic trends in winter water quality. Uh, in, in reservoirs uh, from uh, these two river basins, Brazos and Colorado, uh, including salinity uh, during the 20-year period bracketing the, the 2001 onset of, of toxic blooms. The long-term trend analysis that we've also done confirmed the lack of consistent trends across reservoirs except for total phosphorus. So, conclusions. Uh, we believe that our data shows that ha habitat that is, that is favor favorable to GA, Golden Algae, and Texas reservoirs, defined primarily as waters of moderate salinity, predates the onset of toxic blooms by more than 10 years, and in some cases, several decades. Uh, we believe, based on this data, we can propose uh, two, two patterns or mechanisms of you know, how Golden Alga may colonize and, and lead to bloom formation in, in reservoirs. One is you know, the traditional novel introduction into pre-existing favorable habitat, uh, leading then, within a relatively short period of time, to toxic bloom occurrence. Now, this is, uh, this is consistent with what has already been proposed for Golden Alga based on, on, on genetic uh, uh, or the, or the uh, lack of uh, strong genetic diversity the divergence among Texas golden alga strains and between them golden alga Texas strains and Scottish strains. But we also believe that uh, there could be, I'm sorry, something's happening here with my computer. Uh, there's a, another potential scenario, which is, but before I explain that, I'd like to uh, uh, provide a little more background information. Uh, and that is that uh, it is known that several uh, non-Golden Alga reservoirs of the Colorado, uh, that includes uh, the ones mentioned here, OHIV and Twin Buttes, and at least Waco uh, and the Brazos River contain Golden Alga populations that have never, but these lakes have never formed uh, toxic blooms despite the fact that golden alga is present. So it is possible to envision that as ambient conditions change due to either land use or climate change uh, or other, uh, golden alga population in these reservoirs could develop, could develop toxic blooms. Um, however, another important piece of information is that it has been shown by uh, some other colleagues here in Texas, Roki et al., that increased salinity by itself, uh, at least in the, in the case of uh, Waco, uh, Waco Lake water, is unable to overcome the inability uh, of water from this lake to support golden alga blooms. So salinity itself did not, did not do the trick. So for a change in, in these various reservoirs that contain golden alga blooms, it, normally there are lower salinity than golden alga reservoirs. The change may include, but not necessarily be limited to increased salinity. There may be other variables, other constituents of water that, that may also change. In other words, salinity is, is, is necessary but not sufficient. So given that, you now the other scenario may be essentially what I just said, that golden alga could be introduced into habitat that is, allows its establishment or, or colonization of, 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 the, of, the, of the area or, or the habitat, but not for toxic blooms and then following a gradual change through time, uh, including, as I said, but not limited to increased salinity, then blooms may develop. And we see the, these two scenarios as not being mutually exclusive. Uh, the lack of consistent trends across reservoirs, uh, especially salinity, suggests that any past impacts of climate change on reservoir water quality, and, and I should limit this to Brazos and Colorado because that's where most of our studies have been done, may have been obscured by either reservoir water management options, and remember, remember that reservoirs are highly managed uh, water, water bodies, uh, or, or, or land use changes within reservoirs that may have a, a more prominent impact than, than climate change, or, or, or both. Uh, so if 
climate change, let's assume, has influenced somehow previous expansion of golden oil blooms in Texas reservoirs, generally, it does not appear to have been due to changes in salinity. So going forward, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, this, this we're not suggesting at all that uh, climate change may not uh, have any impacts going forward on the on future uh, distribution of golden alga. What we have done here so far, and we're limited our conclusions to say that historically, or what has happened in the last 10 to 13 years since golden alga appeared uh, in the re in most of the reservoirs here in Texas, it doesn't seem that trends in water quality uh, have had uh, at least, and I need to qualify this too, at least for the variables we measured, uh, doesn't seem to have played a major role in in, uh, in in the in the in the expansion of uh, or the range expansion of the golden algae that we've seen in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, so with that, that's uh, I was told to keep it sweet and short. Um, so that's the main message I wanted to convey. But uh, the other very important thing is to acknowledge uh, the uh, contributor, contributors to this study and. Uh, those include uh, my colleagues from the Texas Water Science Center, uh, William Asquith, uh, Burley, uh, and Don Brooks uh, at Texas Tech. Uh, some of my students and postdocs have been involved. Other colleagues from, from the university, Chris Taylor, Catherine Hayhoe, and other people that work in Catherine's uh, uh, lab. Uh, we've had a lot of contributions and idea sharings and so forth with uh, a number of individuals from Texas Parks and Wildlife. Uh, and also, we've uh, uh, been fortunate to, to, to be able to work with Sean Denny from New Mexico Department of Game and Fish, who's uh, helped us collect samples and also provided uh, historical data on golden algae and water quality for the state of New Mexico. Uh, so with that, I am done. And if uh, anybody has any questions or comments, uh, uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to uh, try and respond. Yes, uh, Barry Rosen. I have a question about, have you looked at turbidity in these lakes? Don't forget these are organisms that need sunlight to grow, and also residence time. They'll flush out fairly easily. If, if the water coming through your reservoir is moving quickly, they won't get a chance to build up. Uh, answer is, um, the first question about turbidity, answer is yes, uh, but only for the short-term data set. That parameter uh, no, I'm trying to remember here, but I, I don't think the data density for turbidity is, or, or the variable is in, in, in the in the historical data set uh, put together by by Burley at all. Uh, I don't believe that was a major variable, or at least not a variable that you could you could associate with a, with a, any any number of significant reservoirs. I, or if it was there, if the data density was so poor that we can use it. We have in the short term studies. No, that's our own studies, our own data. What are called measurements? We we always measure turbidity, and uh, uh, it has not come out. Uh, this is for short-term data set, not historical. It has not come out as a, as an important factor, uh, at least not to define golden algae habitat or to influence its uh, uh, bloom events. Uh, I forget what the other question was. Oh, uh, flushing flow. Uh, yeah. Talk about flow. We have done, um, well, uh, just broadly speaking, um, flows have been shown to be, or, or flushing events. If, if, you, if there's a big flow uh, into a reservoir in the Brazos, we're talk, I'm talking about more in the north and central portion of the Brazos, uh, uh, Possum Kingdom, Granbury, Whitney, uh, the work done by, by others uh, uh, have sh has shown that the uh, uh, Flows or inflows uh, after a rain event uh, or flushing uh, can can influence uh, the uh, you know for example it can cut short uh, a bloom event uh, that you know could happen via a number of mechanisms. One of them, I mean the most the most simple one is uh, you know dilution event. Uh, the reservoirs in the uh, in the Colorado, upper Colorado uh, there's a whole lot of less rain in that part of the state. And and other than when there's a rain event to partially uh, you know, bring up the levels of the reservoir up, 
uh, there's not a, there's no there's very little flushing going on. You know, nobody's releasing water, so to speak, uh, from one reservoir to the next because there's no water or little water. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. And then we have a couple questions from Brendan Freight uh, Bison. Bison. You can go ahead and ask your questions over the phone by pressing star six. I, I had Hi. two questions. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I had two questions. First, do you know whether this microorganism is able to use nitrogen from the atmosphere? Good question. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, uh, it's... Uh, I know that there's uh, it's been shown that total phosphorus can come one of the sources of phosphorus in a lake or in surface waters could be atmospheric from atmospheric deposition. I, I would imagine that the same applies to nitrogen. But but uh, I'm not a geochemist. Uh, uh, right. Uh, I, I couldn't uh, tell you for sure, but I, I suspect that the answer is maybe yes. Yeah, it can't it can't fix atmospheric nitrogen. However, it can take you know. It can't fix atmospheric nitrogen. It can take nitrates that might fall out of the atmosphere, but not. it can't fix like a blue-green can. Yeah. Thank you. And that leads to the second question that I posted. How is the land near the water bodies you sampled used? Is it agricultural, ranching, something else? It depends. Um around some of the, in the upper Brazos, uh, the first slide that I showed you, uh, there's uh, both, uh, there's, uh, well, there's a city, Lubbock, associated with, with the upper Brazos, uh, at least one of the branches of the upper, uh, of the uh, Double Mountain Fork, and then there's another fork that we also included in that study, which is more rural. Uh, ranching is, is, uh, is goes on there. Uh, in lower in the Brazos, um, uh, as you get near, uh, you, know, the, you know, Waco in that area, it, there's a lot of human development there, uh, but there's also agriculture. Um, so the Brazos, both the Brazos and the Colorado, uh, pass through a number of different type, uh, types of landscapes, including rural and urban. Um, in my limited experience, when microorganisms <laughs> proliferate and then stop growing and start releasing strange compounds, it's because they're starved for nitrogen. That is a the biggest problem that um, animals and plants and fungi face on this planet. And I'm wondering where the nitrogen may have come from and or what, when and why it stopped. Any thoughts? Yeah, well, uh, a, a couple of different ways of answering the question. The, the historical database, Burley et al., that we use, had very little, unfortunately. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just the fact that there's not a whole lot of data on, 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 on nitrates and nitrites and so forth. Uh, so, so we couldn't do, uh, you know, the, the only proxy for eutrophication we could use there was total phosphorus. Uh, there's not a whole lot of nitrogen or not nitrogen compounds information. In the shorter term studies, or at least some, not all of them, that we've done, we have measured nutrients in the different fractions of nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, and, and we're still digesting our own data. Now, generally speaking, it's, it's known, other people have shown that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Deviations, uh, you know, either high or low ratios of nitrogen to phosphorus uh, will, will may 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 uh, I guess may make the cells angry and start producing toxins. Uh, so I mean that that work has been done by others. Uh, so so that is known for golden algae as well. Uh, but I can I imagine you know, the sources of nitrogen. If I were to uh, guess, uh, uh, you know, we have not done that study, but if I were to guess from what I know of the landscape. Uh, are 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 uh, rural. There's there's agriculture going on in much of the areas. There's also uh, urban, you no know, wastewater effluent, 
Uh, so that's where I, I would guess that most of the nitrates uh, or not, not uh, organic as well as inorganic uh, sources of, of nitrogen are coming from Thank fertilizers you. and wastewater. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, thank you. We have a text chat question from Rebecca Baldwin, and she says, is there a prediction of what the lower limit is for winter temperature for golden alga to survive? Mm, not that I know. I can just share some of my random knowledge. We have, and this is not medians or averages, uh, but I, I do know uh, we, we once we're actually measuring golden algae cells out in the field. This is in Lubbock, in, in Lubbock Lakes, when the temperature in one of the lakes that was at the time very highly toxic. Uh, we didn't measure cells, but we you know it, it, it was very highly toxic based on bioacid results. Uh, the temperature was around, uh, off the top of my head, uh, take this with a grain of salt, but I think it was somewhere around six, seven degrees Celsius. So. That, that's on the low side. Most blooms, based on, on other work already in the literature, they, they kind of occur somewhere between 10 and 20 degrees Celsius. You know, we've shown a limit in the upper Colorado of about 21, 22, uh, but 10 to 20 or so. But we have seen in, in, at the indi individual blooms happening in a much colder temperature. Now, I don't know enough to be able to say what's the lowest. Uh, I mean, I. There's organisms that survive, survive freezing, um, but I don't know about golden alga. Sorry. All right. Um, Rebecca says thanks. We have another question in the chat box, and it says, have you looked at zooplankton composition for potential predators? And this is from Barbara Dorf. Uh, that's a very easy answer, no. We haven't. Now, others have. Um, colleagues from Texas A&M uh, and, and Baylor have done that work. Uh, I can't, off the top of my head, remember the details of that work. Um, I and mean, Ronaldo, I'm talking about Texas specific... first, of course, here. I know there's work also done uh, by the University of Oklahoma, uh, Lake Texoma. But I, I, that's not our studies. Uh, I don't remember the details, to be honest with you. Well, we have not done those studies. We're primarily interested in, in aspects of, of uh, abiotic habitat. But that's not to say, no, we realize biotic interactions are also very important. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from Hayo Choi. It says, are you interested in monitoring biological toxins in water generated from these golden alga? Am I what? I'm sorry? It says, are you interested in monitoring biological toxins in water generated from those golden alga? Of course. Uh, I think as, 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 long as, uh, as soon as, uh, as the toxin or toxins are are uh, definitely identified, we'll be able to do that. At the moment, there's a number of ideas as to what those toxins might be. Uh, but yes, uh, that's actually until, I, I guess, you know, th th there may be a resolution to that uh, uh, based on, on some recent papers, publications, but uh, until recently, at least, that's been the major problem to measure toxins, that we don't know what to measure. Um, because there's been a there's been a, a debate going on as to uh, or, or no just an ongoing uh, attempt to, to uh, positively identify what the what the actual toxic compounds are that are being produced by golden alga. All right, thank you. And it, that's the last question I'm seeing. Are there any more questions out there? All right, Ronaldo, did you have any closing remarks? Uh, no, uh, I'll just maybe uh, say thank you again to everybody for uh, having taken your time to to, uh, to listen to this presentation. And I said if uh, anybody uh, uh, offline later uh, has any comments or suggestions or 
uh, you know, even to tell me that something I say was wrong. I, I welcome that. Uh, as I say, we're still digesting this information. Um, it has not been fully peer reviewed yet. Uh, so uh, again, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you to the center for inviting me to give this seminar, and um, I hope it was uh, worth your time. <laughs>